Central to Judaism is our thirst for knowledge and our hunger to learn. We're an inquisitive bunch, always questioning, arguing, digging deep to understand and working hard over the past 6,000 years to pass this desire and inquisitive gene onto our children and their children. But the very way we learn and will learn is changing. Recent events have proven to us that there is and must be more than one way of learning and the education system we've created to provide learning to our children itself is struggling to know best how to provide it. Add to the general education uncertainty a Jewish focus, where in Sydney, according to the NAUS education report, there are currently 7,715 Jewish children of school age, dropping down to 5,608 in 2048 with Melbourne and other states experiencing similar declines in potential Jewish students. Add to this dwindling school age population, the issues of future religious observance, assimilation, cultural shift, and the rising cost of a Jewish education. And we arrive at the stark future possibility that sending a child to a Jewish day school may, may no longer be the default choice it once was for Holocaust survivors and their first generation offspring. My name is Morris Mizzle, global futurist, creator and host of Future Jews 2048. And this month, in our continuing search of what Jews and Judaism may be in the future, we explore the future of Jewish education, both formal and informal, and ask, what is a Jewish education? Where is a Jewish education best offered? What is its purpose? Who should provide it? Where is a Jewish education best offered? Will current Jewish educational offerings be enough to stand the test of time? And how do we provide ongoing Jewish education beyond adolescence to both the Jewish and broader societies? Joining me in exploring these incredibly important issues are my three intrepid panelists, each grappling with these issues in their own way. Debbie Kraft is a passionate about Jewish education, having graduated from the Jewish day school system and youth movements. These days, she is president of the United Jewish Education Board, UJEB, which provides formal and informal Jewish education to learners outside the Jewish day school system. She has helped to transform UJEB into the dynamic educational institution it is today, focused on strengthening Jewish identity, engagement, community, and inclusivity. In her spare time and to earn a crust, Gabby is a barrister practicing in commercial law. Welcome, Gabby. Thank you, Morris. Ellen Schwartz's professional life has translated from entrepreneur and business builder to active investor, philanthropist, and social activist. During his legal professional practice year, he started the first of a long series of entrepreneurial ventures. Over the years, Ellen has enjoyed the complex satisfaction of contributing to the not-for-profit sector. He contributed to the creation of Jewish Care, a merger of Jewish community services and Montefiore Homes, and was appointed its inaugural president, life member, and capital appeal patron. Ellen is the past chair of Philanthropy Australia. He and his wife, Carol, established the Trawalla Foundation in 2004 as a vehicle for the family's philanthropic activities. In recognition of his contribution to community and to business, he was awarded a Centenary Medal in 2003, followed by an Order of Australia, AM, in 2007. Welcome, Ellen. And the third of our intrepid explorers this month is Adam Hyman. He is a teacher at Mount Scopus College, currently teaching Jewish studies in years seven through 10 and VCE religion and society. He's also worked as a primary school teacher. He is originally from Sydney and soon celebrates 10 years of Aliyah to Melbourne. He has studied at several yeshivot in Israel, including Yeshivot Malag Gilboa and the Paradas Institute of Jewish Studies. He spends his days and nights when he's not in the classroom and not with his family, pondering the challenges of contemporary education while creating programs that will inspire and challenge young minds. 
He has lived and contributed to the Jewish communities of Sydney, Melbourne, Canberra, Hong Kong, New York and Jerusalem, and believes strongly in the unique culture of the Australian Jewish community. Welcome to all three of you, and thank you for your continued interest in this topic and for joining us. Thanks for having us, Morris. To each of you, perhaps we start with Gabby. Gabby, what's your interest in this topic? Tell us what brought you to the conversation, the future of Jewish education. I think first and foremost um, is uh, my role as chair of the board of UGED, but um, perhaps more broadly, uh, the direction that UGEB has gone in, particularly in the last five years since the Victorian government at the time removed um, religious education from cur the curriculum. So from that point, we engaged in a whole process of reimagining ourselves as we were released effectively. Um, but I've also been the beneficiary of what I often describe as three forms of Jewish education. So uh, cr almost cradle to grave formal education at a, um, at a Jewish day school from lower kinder through to year 12. Um, and I loved it. And I was also uh, involved pretty heavily in a Jewish youth movement. Um, so that's the second arena. And the third arena was my the home I grew up in and the family I, I'm a part of. Um, so they're my three I've been the beneficiary of those three arenas and my interest is in paying it forward. Thank you. I look forward to exploring those three interests in our conversation. And Adam, what brings you to this conversation? I love Jewish education. It's given me so much. It shaped almost everything about who I am as a human being. Um, I, I really want to mimic um, what, what Gabby said. Um, I love my schooling. Um, I love my teachers. Um, my days in my youth movement were the golden, happiest moments of my childhood um, and my youth. Um, the, my, my family loved Jewish education. The only thing I would add to that is also my experiences in Israel um, at various yeshivots were also some of the brightest parts of my life. Um, and I really want to be able to contribute to the next generation of that. Thank you. And Ellen? Um, I'm a bit more unusual, I think, than those um, a little bit more difficult. I'm the child of Holocaust survivors. My parents came from a very orthodox home. Uh, I rejected that orthodoxy and became, a, if you like, a traditional, a, a traditional Jew, non-practicing, really. Um, and um, that was a difficult transition. Uh, I went to government schools, although I had yeshiva training, I had uh, private um, classes for many years, which I had a lovely teacher who, who understood that I was very challenged on, on, on the faith, on the faith side of things, but we had a wonderful relationship and I learned a lot. We outsourced the Jewish education of our children by sending them to Mount Scopus. And years later, our children would tell us about the disconnect between their home life, if you like, and their, and their school life. And they found that, that, that challenging. Um, so I thought, I thought Scopus had actually done a fantastic job with our children um, in educating them. And um, years later, I, about 10 years ago, I wrote a, an op-ed in the Jewish News, which was really quite fanciful. And it was about how to create the greatest Jewish education system in the world. And it was really just describing how Mount Scopus should step forward and sell, sell Burwood and then distribute their children to the other schools and create a corpus for Jewish education to reduce fees. And we should create, um, we should convert some of the government schools into Hebrew, um, Hebrew um, government schools. And the effect of all that would be to reduce school fees by a large amount. And you can imagine when the editor of the Jewish News changed the headline to why Mount Scopus College should be shut down, which isn't really what I was saying, I didn't make a lot of friends. And um, so that's one side. The other side is that I like solving difficult problems. And, you know, I became involved in the in Jewish community services and led the merger with Montefiore Homes because I felt that that was a real serious problem in our community. Montefiore didn't have enough capital to rebuild and Jewish community services were subscale, but each of them had incredible qualities that if you brought them together, you could 
create a greater organization. And I spent about eight years doing that. It was very difficult and extremely rewarding. And when I look at the Jewish, and then and then when um, when Scopus announced that they're moving to Kyong Road, I wrote another op-ed. Um, this one a bit more successful in the sense it was less controversial. And I said that you know their generosity of spirit in wishing to share the, the site with others was nice, but it wasn't going far enough and we needed to actually do it as a community. And um, and uh, that that resulted in, it was a number of different things, but a, a call from Nahama Bendit um, and a coffee with Nahama, who then started telling me, because she's an extremely bright woman and very knowledgeable about the problems of Jewish education, affordability, and what she thought the solutions might be. And we spent the last close, then I assembled a working group to try to work out what we could do about it. And we've spent probably the last 18 months, possibly two years, workshopping it, talking to the schools, talking to parents, talking to philanthropists, talking to others. And I think on the 2nd of August, we've got the pre-launch and then 3rd, 4th and 5th of August, the launch of the, of the discussion paper on the future of Jewish schools. So in a sense, um, you know, uh, I'm, I'm doing it because obviously, I mean, when you examine why you're doing things, I'm doing it because I think there's a real problem. I think that I love solving problems and I'm pretty good at it. Um, so that's why I'm doing it. I mean, but, but the questions that you asked, Morris, are really good ones and probably not examined by myself enough about the future of Judaism and the role of, of education and Jewish education, and what is the role of Judaism in a modern civilization? You know, you've got different versions of Judaism today. You've got the ultra-Orthodox the and you've got the, the liberal. And, um, you know, when I was still involved in Jewish care, and I still think it's the same when I was the president, we managed to hold our community together as one. You know, we managed to negotiate compromises about, you know, Kashrut and Shabbat and Chagim and stuff like that. That, that met the needs of both the orthodox and the unorthodox. So in a sense, we held the community together as one, which is an incredible achievement because in America, it's not like that. You've almost got a, a, broken, society, a broken Jewish society. So I think that one of the challenges for us as a community is not to allow that to happen. Uh, Melbourne is a, a fabulously you know, uh, coherent and integrated community. And if we could find a way for our education system to continue to support a sense of a single community rather than communities that are so different in their values and approach to the world, I think that would be a great achievement. Now, I don't know how that will happen, and I think that's one of the great joys of problem solving is sitting in an uncomfortable place and not freaking out, if you like, and just just be just grinding on and, and seeing where it leads and you know where the where the road leads. As and hopefully that will be our discussion for the next hour or so as well, looking at yeah. those problems and seeing where that may lead us. Yeah. If I can put this into a framework that takes it just that takes it out of Judaism for just a couple of moments. Over the last 20 or 30 years, I've explored the area of the future of education globally and worked with many institutions grappling around this issue of what education may be moving forward. The one thing that we agree on universally is that the education system that our children are currently exposed to was built with love and care, but it was built for an industrial revolution model when everything was known, when the outcomes were perfect, and when it was likely that there would be one or two careers for that child, and that she or he would be able to pick up skills at school that would see them through life. The reality is we all know it now is that that given, that promise is no longer there that our children will more than likely live to 100 and beyond, that there will be some income generation or some purpose that they have that will see them working or in the workforce until their 80s or 90s, that the skill that they learn at school will be obsolete by the time they leave school. And that, again, is with care and intent, but only because the world is evolving around them. We need to train them to be constant learners, to be eager, to be curious, to be thinking and to be able to, as Alan said, problem solve throughout their lives. This is the challenge of all educational institutions. We don't yet have a system that allows that to happen. So behind the scenes of our discussion, there is this structural change that needs to take place across the globe of what is education, how is it provided, how do children engage with it, and how do we get generational 
interest in education because education should not finish at year 12 or at the end of a university qualification. There are seven phases to our lives. And for most of our formal education, it is mostly within those first three phases. So I give that as a background behind the notion that it's not just Jews that are struggling with what education of the future might be. It is society as a whole. We know that we have to meet this challenge because nothing is more important to us than ensuring our children are able to adapt and to evolve and to thrive in their future lives. Lay onto that, the conversation we're about to have moving forward because our discussion as it is each month is not about the pragmatism of today. We're looking to resolve the issues of tomorrow and the next 10 years and beyond. We're looking for possible solutions that we can begin to feather in right now that might take us down that journey and give us the learning and education space that we know we want our children to have. So with that background of there being flux in the outside world, of there being the last year through COVID where we have had a forced experiment of how education might be offered in different ways, not being perfect and not being set, but it's an understanding that there might be a different way or a different possibility. I want to come back then into our Jewish conversation and ask the panel, what is a Jewish education? Um, Maris, I, I really like the way you framed that. Um, I agree with you. This isn't just a conversation Jews are having. It's a conversation that our society is having. Um, and, and one of the ways that I like to think about this, um, I'll, I'll come back to that later, actually. In answer to what is a Jewish education, um, and I think the way it links to both wider education and Jewish education, is Jewish education is an initiation into the Jewish community. It is part of that ongoing initiation from birth to wherever we are in our lives today. Um, if you're trying to foster greater engagement with the community, greater engagement with Jewish ideas, greater engagement with Jewish mannerisms and social norms, um, then it's part of that process. It's the building of that foundation. And so I think often what we, what we get confused about with Jewish education is we ask questions like how many texts have they learned? How many units on Zionism have they covered? Um, how much have we taught about the Holocaust? Um, and all those things are valuable, 100%, absolutely. That's the content, that's the tachlis of the education. But what we're missing is where are those social norms? How do Jews talk? How do Jews think? How do Jews challenge? How do Jews verbalize and articulate and argue? Um, and I think that needs to be a part of that. Uh, education and I think it needs to come from home I think it needs to come from youth rooms I think it needs to come from schools um, but it's really about the way in which it's all the human skills that go behind the soft skills the humans that go behind the hard skills Helen Gabby so uh, I'm, I'm fully support everything Adam just said particularly um, this concept of initiation into the Jewish community and I think Continuous Jewish education is not just initiate, it's, it's to build on that, is to continuous, continuously engage. Um, uh, I think um, Alan alluded to something really important in the way that we have traditionally conceived of Jewish education. And um, I think if we go back to what Alan originally said, he his, his parents being Holocaust survivors were orthodox and he and his family rejected that and I think at that time there was a binary model you were either orthodox or you weren't and if you weren't you were turning your back on it effectively or seen to be whether you were or weren't you were seen to be turning your back on it um, and I think today we start from a completely different premise there are so many different ways of being Jewish um, and the great challenge, as Alan also articulated, is for our communal institutions, particularly our educational institutions, to bring together um, and create a, effectively a harmonious environment where all those threads and all those expressions of Judaism can coexist. Um, so against that backdrop, understanding that there are many different ways to be Jewish, um, Jewish education, to my mind these days, has to encompass a great diversity and be inclusive. Um, now, that poses a great number of challenges to certain parts of Judaism, but it is possible, as Ellen's demonstrated, at Jewish Care, it's achieved, at UJEB, it's achieved. Um, and, and so mm. it, from that rubric, I think 
um, there is great potential to achieve the outcomes that Adam has alluded to. And Ellen? Well, when I started this process um, of looking at the Jewish schools, I had a very narrow question, and that was that it was too expensive and I wanted to make it more affordable. But I didn't realise that what I was doing was actually only thinking about the, uh, the parents and the children of this, the ones who are at the school who are struggling to stay in there. And uh, it's more recently that I, I came to realise the more important question of the people that were excluded. Um, and Gabby, you'd relate to that very strongly. So we've got this, the, the other side of that same coin is that it's very expensive for parents who send their kids to Jewish schools, but there's a, a huge number of children that, that are completely excluded. And that was reflected in the constitution of the working group itself, which didn't have a single person who represented the, uh, the, 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 we haven't even started the consultation, Gabby, and that's already out from the drafts that I've, I've shared. And um, that's something, you know, my immediate reaction is we'll fix that. We'll put, we'll put representatives of parents. So, so that was one thing. And the other thing that I realised, and it was something that I sort of knew, but it became even clearer to me, was the conflict inside the Jewish community about making uh, the religious experience of children who are not going to Jewish schools a better one and a richer one. Uh, because every time you do that, you validate, if you like, not going to a Jewish school, which increases the number of children who might leave the Jewish schools, um, and that's a threat to the Jewish schools. So that's a political uh, minefield that we're going to have to explore. So, for example, Gabby, I don't feel that UJEB is anywhere near adequately supported relative to the Jewish schools and the Jewish school system. And I ask myself why, and I think that's the answer. And when you think about the other thing that I think is going to come out of the consultation, and, you know, I, I can't predict it all, but I think it's pretty clear that the concept of a Hebrew government school, you know, which is quite prevalent in other countries, you know, we've got Japanese government schools and we've got French and German, but we don't have a Hebrew government school with, with a community as, <clears throat> as powerful as ours. It's incredible that we haven't done that. And then I ask myself the question, why have we not done that? Because there is, there is the desire to make a Jewish school education affordable to everybody so that everyone can go to a Jewish school. Um, and I think that's laudable. But if you get to the point where you realise that however much work you do to reduce fees, whatever that might be, and there are a number of initiatives described in the report, they may never be enough. And there's always going to be groups that are excluded um, groups who care about their Jewish identity, feel excluded, aren't comfortable going through a process of eva financial evaluation, uh, aren't, you know, aren't, aren't confident about the confidentiality of that process, so would rather choose to send their children to, to, to a government school. That's stuff we haven't really touched on in the first report because we were very narrow and the question that we asked ourselves, you can see, you'll see it in the report, there is a section at the end about greater cooperation, but really um, it's all about how do we make fees in those four schools in particular lower rather than the broader question of how do we create uh, a good Jewish education for everyone depending on regardless of whether they're secular or orthodox and regardless of whether they're wealthy or not wealthy. So that, that I can just see the consultation is going to, I'm anticipating it, but I know from the early, you know, copies I've sent to a few people that they were the sort of standout uh, items of feedback. And that's, that's going to make it really very difficult because there's going to be vested interests that are not going to necessarily want, you know, there, there's vested interests that don't want to change the way the four schools work. We already know that. Then there's vested interests that say those four schools together don't want anything to happen outside that will take from the four schools outside. So that's a that's a, a, a real a real challenge. But I haven't even that is what I've said is so incredibly sort of narrow and practical. You know, relative Morris and Adam uh, in particular, the comments that you're making about what it means to be a Jew, what's the sustainable model for a Jewish community in a liberal modern society. You know, I don't even know the answer to that. Alan, can I ask, when you talk about the four schools, which schools are you mentioning? Which schools do you have in uh, mind? The reason we only chose Yavna, 
uh, King David, Bialik and Scopus was because they were by, um, um, uh, what do you, uh, by, not bilingual, but um, co-educational. Mm -hmm. So because some of the options that we're proposing require co-educational. And so whereas some of the options like a fee assessment board and, and the others would allow the other schools to participate, we felt that the, well, we've got, um, firstly, we've got, uh, we've got the ultra-Orthodox ones that will not consider um, co-education. And then we've got Sholem Aleichem, which doesn't go past year seven, so we excluded them as well. And that's another thing that's going to come out, that we really should be a bit broader in the way we look at it. But we're sort of almost starting off defeated by just dealing with those four schools in terms of the, what I was saying about holding the community together. So as, 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 oh, yeah. No, no, go around. Which I think um, perhaps gets missed in this conversation is uh, I've actually worked a little bit in the Haredi school sector. Um, I've worked at Adas, I've worked at Divrei Amuna, which is um, the sort of right-wing breakaway from Adas. Um, and actually what I think people in our community don't realise is there have been, I think, five new Haredi schools in our community in the last 15-ish years, of which three of them have started in the last five years. Um, and they're all more affordable. Um, there are different models of schooling that are not, as you said, the four main institutional schools of our community. And if you go for this approach that actually embraces more diversity rather than a, a shrinking of resources to, to drive down costs, which is basically that, that economic model of um, scales of economy, um, which I think doesn't work for schools. I think when schools get bigger, they get more expensive. Mm. A smaller school, or rather several smaller schools mm. um, that cater to niche communities with, with yeah. more niche values, both provide diversity and opportunity um, where parents are actually fully buying into a school model, but also they're actually more affordable. Smaller schools are cheaper and there's so much evidence for that. And I don't know why our community is missing that. So yeah. I, want to ask, I want to ask the question behind all of this. As the child of a Holocaust survivor, my parents had an imperative, for whatever reason, to send me to a Jewish day school. It was, as I refer to it, the flag up the flagpole, that they had achieved something. I carried on that angst and sent my children, sent our children to a Jewish day school. Will my children send their kids to a day, Jewish day school? I'm not sure. And that's a decision they make. I hope that they will. But I ask the question, we're all in this discussion so far saying that the choice will be an economic one. Will it be? Even if, even if fees were affordable, do tomorrow's generation, today's generations want to send their kids to a Jewish day school? Or do they just want to send them to a great school? But I, um, uh, that's a great um, platform for me to, I suppose, respond, not just to you, Morris, but also to Alan and Adam. Um, I think um, uh, understanding the background of Jewish education, particularly in Victoria, the flag up the flagpole, as you say, Morris, um, it became de rigueur and absolutely fundamental to our thinking about Jewish education um, to place on a, an absolute gold-plated pedestal um, the Jewish education delivered by um, particularly the four main Jewish day schools. And what that did, and that's, I, I, don't, I make no criticism of that, I think absolutely for the times it was right, um, what flows from that is a psyche and, um, and a set of assumptions, and, and I'll admit to having swallowed them holus bolus without realising, a set of assumptions about what is the best way to educate the child um, about their Jewish heritage, their Jewish culture, language, etc. Let me give you an example because I want to speak to Alan's point about a whole set of people who are excluded. Alan used the language of exclusion and you talked about wealthy or not wealthy. Um, I, as I mentioned, I went to 
um, a Jewish day school from lower kinder to year 12. I had an amazing experience. I was at Mount Scopus. I loved my education. My, father, my late father went there. My sister went there. My mother taught there for decades. My husband went there. My husband's sister went there. We all went there. It was it in a bit. And I think I had a very um, clear view in my mind about the types of people who did not elect to bust their guts the way my parents did to send me to Mount Scopus. Mm -hmm. To my mind, um, and I think I'm not alone here, and I think this assumption still prevails subconsciously, um, people who did not send their kids to Jewish day schools were fell into one of two camps, or both. Either they were assimilated, a word that we don't use very often these days for good reason because it's highly offensive, but that was the word in my mind that, that stuck. They were either assimilated or wanted to assimilate and or were self-hating Jews or they were poor or both. And it's a crude way of explaining the set of assumptions that were in my head, but I think, and I even I think as a teenager was able to um, critically analyse a lot of things, that prevailed for me right up until the day I sent my son to the local primary school for prep. In fact, it probably prevailed for a little bit after as well. I um, was terrified of sending my child to a school outside the Jewish day school system. Um, but I want to blow up this myth, I think, about the notion of exclusion and wealthy or not wealthy. Um, it's much, with great respect, Alan, it's much more nuanced than that. Um, my husband and I both work full time in um, as professionals. We um, fall into that middle category. I don't think we're either wealthy or not wealthy. We're very comfortable, but we also um, place great value in not. Um, we place great value on our children's um, and our families' um, health and well-being and mental health. And 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 I'm going to be upfront: not putting our family under financial stress. Um, is, a, is of as great value to us as is a Jewish education, particularly when um, we could roll our sleeves up, as I did, and get involved in UJEB and make it um, uh, a fantastic provider of Jewish education, not to mention the work that my husband and I do in our home to supplement that. Okay, so there, can I just interrupt and ask, for yeah. those that aren't familiar with UJEB and how it operates, could you give us just a brief, brief insight into it? Yeah, sure. So it's an organisation that's 125 years old. Um, it started as the boards of the Orthodox synagogues um, and delivered Jewish education to all Victorian Jewish students back in the day before there were Jewish day schools. And then over time, as the Jewish schools emerged, um, uh, UJEB became the sole provider of um, religious education in Jewish day schools, sorry, in government schools. Um, and that was its remit um, up until about five years ago, five or six years ago, when that that was that ceased. Um, and religious education is no longer taught uh, as part of the Victorian curriculum. Um, now, providers of um, what is called religious education are required to provide it before school, after school, or at lunchtime. And as I mentioned earlier on, that gave us the opportunity to reinvent ourselves. So we actually don't deliver religious education anymore. We now deliver cultural engagement, um, a much more holistic approach to Jewish education, and we do it before school, after school, and at lunchtime. And we do it from grade uh, from prep through to year 12 and we do it through a whole range of programs and a whole range of modes of learning um, from quite formal um, intensive Hebrew language programs at, at primary school level, a Jewish life program through to much, much more experiential um, programs, a trip to Israel in year 10 when we're able to do it. Um, we're developing, an, as Adam knows, an unbelievable um, online learning program, um, not a Zoom-based program, as in a, an interactive online program for our teens. Um, we have an, an engagement with um, the BBYO organisation in the US, which has 80,000 members, and our kids connect in with that. We, we take a, a, much, um, a much broader approach than we used to to Jewish education. But I do want to explode for this community this myth that if you don't go to a Jewish school, you're being excluded or that you're not wealthy. Um, 
it, it's it's just my experience of our of our of our families is that that's just not the case, and that the reasons for being outside the Jewish day school system are varied and nuanced. Um, and it is in that nuance, I think, that that's the space where the conversation about where's Jewish education heading in the next 30 years, that's the space where we really actually need to be engaging much, much more deeply. So it is a reality right now that 40% of Jewish students in Victoria do not attend Jewish day schools. We can either keep keep trying to shoehorn those 40% back into the four major Jewish day schools, or we can actually face the reality that there are, um, and actually, as, as Alan's report will indicate, a growing number of students that are not in the Jewish schools, and it isn't just because they're not wealthy. Um, it, uh, it, in my mind, yes, absolutely, we need to um, make Jewish formal Jewish education in the Jewish day schools more affordable. Um, I'm all for it. And, and please don't let this be heard as a, any kind of criticism or diminution of what those four Jewish day schools do. I'm a big fan of them. But if we don't face the reality that we have and we don't cater for that reality, um, we're actually going to lose a huge chunk of our community and we're not going to deliver to them a proper Jewish education. So, um, yes, one um, of our uh, aims is to enable our UJEP kids to re-enter the Jewish day school system if and when their parents decide and they decide that it's the right time to go back in, and we very much support that. Um, but investing in UJEP and investing in the future of those students that sit outside the Jewish day school community, I really want this community to stop focusing on that as a threat to Mount Scopus, Yavna, King David and Bialik. The two can coexist. And if we each strengthen, um, if we strengthen each mode of learning, we strengthen our community. So everyone needs to stop sort of worrying about their patch and start thinking about the community. Um, when, we, when we embolden and strengthen Jews who educate their children outside the Jewish day school system, we strengthen our entire community and maybe even get those kids to um, beg their parents to send them to a Jewish, Jewish day school. I don't know. But let's get real and let's start thinking forward rather than fixing the model that um, resulted from flying the flag up the flagpole. Alan, Adam, thoughts? Um, two things. Uh, first of all, um, I want to really plug you, Jeb. Um, I was involved with UJEB for a brief time with a particular initiative of theirs. Uh, um, and my meetings with the team at UJEB were the most creative, open-minded, um, enthusiastic, eager, excited meetings about Jewish education I've ever had. Um, I, my involvement with the project didn't, didn't go all, all the way. So I actually didn't see the classrooms. Um, and I actually didn't see the learning, but I have so much faith in an institution based on the culture of the organization that I saw with the people I worked with. Um, so a real kola kavod to you, Jeb, and, and thank you, Gabby, for the work you do. Um, but I think also um, it's a multi-pronged approach. There's no panacea to this. There's no one solution. Um, it's not that the schools need to be more affordable. It's that we need lots of solutions to this problem. Um, in the Gen 17 uh, uh, survey, the highest answer provided, I don't remember what the statistics were, the highest answer provided for why people aren't choos choosing a Jewish day school was affordability. Um, it's not the only answer, absolutely not. And I've spoken to plenty of people and I have plenty of friends of mine who are choosing not to send their kids to a Jewish day school because they don't like the culture of the Jewish day school. They say they're fine, I get that, there's lots of reasons. Um, but affordability is a major one. And part of the solution is UJEB. Part of the solution is other organizations stepping up. Part of the solution is new schools that can be cheaper, that are choosing to forego certain um, infrastructure or, or quantity of staff or certain resources to be able to provide a Jewish education, a more affordable Jewish education. Um, but I think speaking as someone who's from a, a younger generation, I think part of the problem is that um, my generation needs to see there are people willing to fund these things. These things take money. 
these things also really fundamentally take people putting their hand up and saying, this is going to be my career. And there's so much uncertainty. The financial circumstances of my generation are really hard. And I think if there aren't funds set up, if there aren't people saying, here is a hundred thousand dollars, we are looking for uh, people to set up certain initiatives uh, in the Jewish day school, in, in the Jewish community, um, addressing Jewish education. We want ideas. The resources are there for you. I think people will put up their hands. But who's well, going to do it? Who's going to do it with so much uncertainty financially? We well, can't. What a, yeah. What a fabulous conversation, um, Gabby. Thank you for that feedback. I agree with everything you've said. And I think it's a mea culpa that really this journey started with the Jewish schools and affordability, and it's now progressing towards uh, education in the Jewish community. And I assure you that the 2022 report will look very different to the 2021 report because that clearly is coming out, this, this nuance. But a couple of observations. Um, firstly, I'm going to have to learn a lot more about you, Jeb, because I went to Melbourne High School and there was no class I hated more than um, religious education. I made sure I got thrown out of every single class because we had, um, I won't name him, someone that came and made us feel like shit about ourselves, right? That we were at Melbourne High and we should have been at the other schools. We should have, um, and why were our parents not sending us there and what was the matter with us, right? So that was a very much the things that you're, you're saying should not be the case. And uh, clearly you're working really hard to change, to change that perception. I'm told that's point number one. Point number two, I'm told by many of the schools that, oh, we give lots of scholarships, but you know what? They're not really interested in coming. The parents who send their kids to, um, to uh, which goes to your point, uh, Gabby, that, that they send their kids to McKinnon or whatever, it's because they want, or they can even send their kids to Wesley or Scotch because they want a different sort of education. But then I get approached by Howard Sachs and his group who basically say to me, that's bullshit. You know, we really want to send our kids to Jewish schools, but we're excluded for financial reasons. It's too expensive. And the whole process. So you've got so many different sources of information. And why do people, you know, what does our report say about why they don't go to Jewish schools? It's not just financial. It's cultural. It's values. Um, it's demographic. And it's going to get worse because the number of school-aged children is going to decline by 23% as Morris said in his opening, uh, over the next uh, 20 years. So um, they're connected problems, but they're different problems. And I think we need to, but then you talk about, Gabby, you talk about cooperation. You know, I'm looking at four schools and saying, how do we cooperate to make it more cost-effective for all of you? And the feedback that I get uh, from the people I talk to is, Alan, this is fabulous work you're doing, but it's all too hard. You can't get them to cooperate because they're all looking after their own patches. And my reaction to that is that's their job. I don't want to be critical of the schools for acting as fiduciaries of their institutions. What we don't have in this community is, is any group of people who think more broadly for all the schools. Now what we're saying is we need to think about the whole community, which makes it even harder because those four schools have one thing in common, even though they have a lot separating them. They don't want to make to create opportunities either in government school, particularly in government schools, for children to feel good about themselves or parents to feel good about themselves for having made that choice. Because if that becomes a valid choice, because UJB is hugely successful, if that becomes a valid choice because we get two or three Hebrew government schools and the whole experience is fabulous and it costs a fraction and it's much more diverse and it's got all of those other things, that's a threat to those four schools together as a, as a group. So I don't know the answer, and I'm really putting it out there as a, as a problem. Once you, the broader you make the problem, uh, the harder it becomes to solve because you've got the collective action um, challenge becomes harder and harder because the interests become broader and broader. So uh, I find this conversation very challenging and, and very useful and uh, happy to already accept as a mere culpa that it's not acceptable just to think about the schools. It's not acceptable to have on the working group just parents and ex-parents and ex-presidents of schools, but we must involve people who think about the rest of the community. 
we must recognise that some of those people are not in the Jewish day school system because they, they don't want to be, um, and some of them are not in the Jewish day school system because they can't afford to be. So um, it's a complex web. So putting aside this notion of fees, which I often refer to as a Jewish contraception, and having, having a few children being able to send them to a Jewish day school, which was the choice made, I think, by my generation. We've assumed in this entire conversation that Jewish education has to happen within walls, has to happen within the physicality of an institution somewhere between kindergarten and year 12. I want to ask the question, though, as Jews, we have always had Jewish culture that's been passed on, Torah Shabal Peh, Torah by mouth. We've talked about Jewish communities, about Jewish youth groups, what role do these informal places have or do they have a place in Jewish education? Because I would argue K-12, kindergarten to 12, is only part of the journey. How do we get Jewish education more broadly delivered? And how do we make people excited about wanting to accept it? Again, just as an aside, we're talking about an education system moving forward that will be delivered just in time. It won't be a system anymore where we pick up knowledge and store it in our brain, waiting for some future moment to be able to use it. It's more like the YouTube experience, but it will be on YouTube, where once I need to know something, I go searching for that information. That's not going to happen in K-12. to I might need to know something in my 30s, 40s or 50s or want to discover something or become involved. How do we as a community foster that sort of education? So it's actually... It's, that is such a great, um, uh, really existential que question. That's um, it's it's huge. I for me, my own personal philosophy is um, no one person has ownership over this mantle of Judaism or what is a Jew, right? So, one of the great tragedies of um, uh, Jewish life, sometimes I think, can be. If I'm not, um, if I don't have payers and if I don't have an at shul, you know, every Shabbos, um, I'm not Jewish. <laughs> and actually, uh, in, if, if we can encourage more Jews in the community to plug into all the good stuff about Judaism without feeling threatened by um, having to be or not being, um, a particular type of Jew and enjoying the culture of Jewish education, uh, of being Jewish, um, you can start increasing Jewish literacy, connection, engagement, and so on and so forth. Um, this notion that you know uh, there's only one way of being a Jew is needs to we just need to move on from it. And so, um, celebration of Jewish life and Jewish culture. Um, whatever your level of observance and whatever your political leaning may be, I, you know, I hope um, is something that we can continue to encourage, not just in, uh, as you say, school-aged children, Morris, but, but beyond. And so some of the amazing things that are done by, you know, like, for example, the Jewish Museum to run adult education classes, um, there's a whole, you know, the Centre for Jewish Civilization at Monash, running an incredible series these things do not require of you to participate necessarily in all the restrictions that judaism can sometimes impose but also to just enjoy um other parts of judaism that can keep you connected without yeah the the, the sort of needing necessarily to buy into all the onerous stuff now, i'm going to probably get it slammed by the by the um community that would say that that's picking and choosing as i we all pick and choose. Even the most observant people pick and choose because someone more observant than them will say that they pick and choose. So if we just stop thinking in that framework and start thinking about what we can enjoy, what we can connect to without criticising ourselves, let alone criticising others, um, we're going to really boost Jewish engagement. So how do we provide this ecosystem of continual ability to learn to engage, which I think will eventually fall, will eventually waterfall down to K to 12. Yeah. <clears throat> I Adam, think, Alan? oh yeah, Alan, go first. No, I, I, I um, Gabby, when I sort of uh, decided I wasn't going to be religious, I really didn't have the clear pathways. 
of how it was to be Jewish without being religious. And for a long period of my life, I believed, without exam detailed examination, that Judaism belonged to the people who were orthodox. <clears throat> they created it, and it wasn't our right to steal Judaism from them and to re and to twist it and turn it around to suit our modern ideas, that we had to respect them and that we'd moved somewhere else. Now, what you're saying, and I really got this uh, in my later life from conversations with Mark Baker, that we can claim Judaism because they don't own it. Um, and we can claim Judaism as a cultural thing because when you come from an orthodox background, what, what's drummed into you is that as you dilute Judaism to a cultural thing, it loses its energy and its power, and within, within one or two generations, it's gone. Yeah. And the only way to maintain it is absolute strict um, compliance with a set of rules. You know what? Sadly, there's a lot of truth to that, and I think we don't have a model of Judaism which is, if you like, in their words, watered down and stolen from them. I don't think we have it. I don't think we've had the intellectual um, leadership in the, in the world of Judaism to define a modern Jew that's in a sustainable way. The German Jews tried it. And I think it's a washed down version of Judaism that never is sustained. If the idea is sustaining it, then I don't think it gets sustained. And I don't think we have a model. And I I'm not pushing a point of view. It's just an observation that uh, something to be sustained requires uh, a very strict um, series of rituals. It needs oppression from the outside, which we fortunately have not had for a while, um, for 70 years, um, to bring us together. So they're, they're challenging things. And I'm with you now, Gabby, that they don't own it. Uh, we can claim it and we can define it. But I don't know that we've actually got the right answers yet to make it sustainable. And I don't actually even know what a sustainable model of Judaism is in a modern world. Um, what makes Jew Jews different to modern, uh, thoughtful, liberal um, minded people? Um, uh, you know, because that's what we have been for a long time as a people. That's what differentiated us. But the world itself, in some ways, uh, there are a lot of people that I mix with who, in terms of their values, they may as well be Jewish in the sense that you're describing, Gabby, you know, the love of mankind and sense of decency and, and a sense of history and culture and, and thoughtfulness and, you know, the various other things. But I'm not quite sure um, uh, what it is. And it's, it's too complicated for me to understand other than I've broken through uh, the, the trap that says, if you're not religious, you're not Jewish. You've got no right to claim it from them. It's theirs. They made it. It's theirs. They own it. They set the rules. If you want to leave, you're somewhere else. I don't accept that anymore. But I also don't believe that we found a model that actually is sustainable. Adam, thoughts? Um, yeah, I'm just trying to gather them. Um, thank you for your contributions, um, Alan and Gabby. Um, uh, I think that part of what's just been said is actually just the zeitgeist of a previous generation that I, I don't think exists to the same degree in my generation. Um, I, I mean, I'm, I'm part of that Orthodox camp, um, you know, the, the unorthodox of the Orthodox. Um, my Shabbat table is filled with people who are not religious, um, who, who have chosen to marry someone who's not quote unquote within the faith. Um, I, I just, I just don't think my generation, people younger than that have those fears. I think a lot of it is a post Holocaust mentality, which I understand. Absolutely. Um, I think a lot of it is actually just the way in which Judaism had to engage with modernity, um, in a previous generation. Um, I, I think things are a bit more, perhaps this is a cliche, but a bit more postmodern now. Um, can, we, can we really drill into that? Because that's the answer. The answer lies in your generation. Um, if that's true, I find that very uplifting um, and uh, very exciting. Because when I look at my children, um, they're all good and proud Jews, but not Orthodox in the least. And, and, and it's something that I need to understand. I bet they don't have baggage about it either. Sorry? Ask them. I bet they don't have baggage about not being Orthodox. I don't think there's a trauma there that perhaps your generation 
rightfully may may carry. I really have to endorse what Adam's saying, Alan. Um, oh, I feel like I want to invite you and Carol over for a Shabbat dinner at our house. You can see we're not practising Jews, but we celebrate Shabbat with our kids every Friday night and every Chag. Like we have a Sukkah. We are not um, what you would describe, Alan, I think, or in your mind as from at all. But we celebrate the culture of um, being Jewish quite um, firmly um, and... Um, I, I hope, um, you know, uh, what Adam, I think what I, my sense is that what Adam says is, is really right. I'm not, I'm not saying it's faultless and I'm not saying it's perfect. And I'm not saying that we have every answer to, um, you know, uh, the risks that, that we face, um, as a Jewish community, but I do think that we are living that, um, that alternate model and I do think, um, I'd love to think I'm Adam's generation, but I'm not quite. But his generation and my generation are living that sort of um, untraumatised or less traumatised um, uh, model of thinking. We're not, li- we're not thinking in, in a dichotomous way. And, and I say this with the greatest of respect. I understand it completely because I've been the, I've been the product of it. But we, we are moving on and we are celebrating being Jewish in a cultural way a lot of us and 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 that's what enables us to have you know that enables me to have friends who are um not just modern orthodox but you know um, orthodox and um friends who uh uh you know who go to temple and it it makes sort of no real material difference because we're just living our own expressions of jewish culture and that's the underpinning of our discussion today. I mean, this dichotomy that we're exploring now really does talk to what the future of education needs to be, because it is very much set in a Holocaust, post-Holocaust framework. It is provided with great love and structure by people from that generation and offered to the generation that you're speaking of. And I think that is part of the big disconnect, that we don't necessarily need the brand or the premises, that education can be informal, it can be formal. It's offered by community. It's offered by people in a structured format like Adam. But the necessity, the question, the underpinning question is, is there a desire or a need for Jewish education, not religious, but Jewish education? And our discussion today, I think, proves or at least goes some way towards exploring the fact that, yes, there is. Definitely. It's likely not the guys that we have it now. By 2048, it might be very, very different. It might not be structural. As we started with, the notion of education, the way it's provided, will more than likely take care of a lot of that. We need to decide as a generation, as a custodian of Judaism moving forward, how we want to disseminate that on to the next generations, how we make it palatable and acceptable for them. education changed in 2048 compared to what it was in 2021? Well, I'm happy to go first because I found this an incredibly useful um, conversation. And um, I'm a very adaptable person, Gabby, so I'm not traumatised for a long time, but it was it was an experience that I had, was able to observe and I think the answer lies in, and Morris, you've done a great job of making us forget that we're in, re, in recording and, and others may watch this. And I'm very cognizant of that as the convener of the Jewish Schools Project and the politics involved in all of that. But in answer to your question, I think that what I would say is that the, uh, the cultural and demographic and financial pressures on the schools over the next 20 years plus the opportunities that have been created for a different type of Jewish education will mean that the dominance of the Jewish schools as a monolithic structure will be less in 2048 than it is now. There'll be a more diverse uh, range of options for Jewish children to receive their their Jewish identity and their Jewish continuity and their culture. Um, And therefore, the top priority has got to be to um, to deal with the um, the financial pressures that are on the schools and make that um, 
unfold as seamlessly as possible rather than painfully, but actively develop strong alternative models that are viable for the community that don't require, you know, as it was in post-Holocaust, that everyone's got to go to a Jewish school. So that'll be my observation. It'll be much more diverse um, and it won't be as dominated by the Jewish day schools, but there'll be um, uh, a range of options, including Jewish day schools and perhaps more junior schools, which are cheaper, Adam, coming back to your point, because I think VCE, if you do the economic analysis, needs to be big in order to be efficient. But the, the junior schools, um, because you need a lot, lot of subjects and stuff like that, but if you look at Shola Malaysia, they can run small fees as well. It's not just the religious components. So I think you can have a lot of diversity in junior schools and make it fairly cheap. And you may have to do something bigger in VCE to get to get scale. Um, and you're going to have to make UGEB stronger and you're going to have to create Hebrew government schools and, and a whole range of things over the next 20 years. Thank you. And Gabby, Adam, a final word from you? Um, I'm... Um, I... I honestly couldn't say with any at all what it's going to look like in 2048 because I'm not sure even five years ago I could have contemplated saying the things I'm saying today. Um, what I do know is that um, I'm committed to not being in any kind of rigid mindset about what Jewish education might be in Victoria, Australia, globally. Um, uh, and I hope actually that we, um, yeah, that we have a growth mindset and an expansive mindset and, and are willing to blow up assumptions all along the way so that we can make the best use of um, all the resources out there globally. Um, I do just want to make a final comment, circling back to something that Adam said about um, investing in, you know, teachers of Jewish education, deliverers of Jewish education, I would hope that with um, growing um, positive engagement with Jewish culture, which is something, for example, at UGEB we're really fostering, that we can encourage more of our um, learners in time to want to pay it forward to the next generation. And I, I hope this community not just invests in um, getting efficiencies and um you know, uh, you know, investing in infrastructure, but also investing in people. Um, I really, really support what Adam said, and I really hope that we can create a pathway for our learners to become deliverers of Jewish education to the next generation. And Adam? Amen, amen. Thank you, Gabby. I, I agree with that. I hope so too. Um, I, um, uh, Alan, um, I, I, I love what you've said. Um, uh, and it's not just Shalom. Um, Mount Sinai in Sydney, um, also significantly cheaper um, than all the other Jewish schools. They've got a really interesting fee structure, um, which, um, which is the same cost across all the year levels, which I think is a really interesting model where they're not charging more as you go through the school, which to me feels a bit unfair, unreasonable. Um, anyway, fine. Um, uh, I think VCE also, I think Yusare Hatora recently um, in one of the years past um, had students scoring really high in the state, possibly even a perfect score, I don't recall. Um, and they're a school that offers very few subjects. Um, there are ways to do VCE cheaper. Absolutely, there are ways. Um, in fact, and we don't talk about this, there are plenty of independent schools in the state that do not charge the exorbitant fees that our schools do. It can be done. Um, we're just not looking to them. Um, there's a new uh, small Muslim school starting in South Clayton based on an alternative model of schooling, um, based on the Fitzroy Community School model. If you're familiar, perhaps we can talk about it offline. Um, there are ways to do it. There are absolute ways to do it, and we're not looking outside of our tent, and we need to be. In 2048, um, I think we will have a community that is richer and more diverse with more options. Um, and I think with more options, people can feel comfortable stepping in and out of their silo. I think that is how we build diversity. And that's how we actually build a connected community um, that respects one another. When your actual personal needs are being met, you can then converse respectfully 
um, and, and compassionately and affectionately with other members of the community who sit in a different silo to you. When your needs are not being met, it's actually much harder to do that. And I think that comes with more infrastructure, more opportunities, more options. Um, and I, I, I'll, I'll say one other thing, which is actually there are some amazing things happening in our community. Um, one of the largest Friday night Shabbat services uh, in Melbourne, um, not during COVID, um, is, is Koleno, which is a secular humanist um, Shabbat service with, with, with music being played, with group singing, with um, a Shabbat drasha given by both people who are secular, people who are religious. I've given a Shabbat drasha there before. Um, there are many ways to do a, a non-denominational, a post-denominational and inviting Jewish community. Um, and my classroom is one of them. Um, and I think in 2048, we'll be doing a lot more of that. So thank you. As you can see, this discussion has been incredible. It's taken us literally all over the plethora of possibilities of what the future of education, Jewish education might be. To our panellists, Gabby Crafty, Alan Schwartz, Adam Hyman, thank you so much for giving generously of yourself and entering this conversation in such a willing and giving way. I want to also, while I'm thanking, thank my team of wonderful, of six wonderful wise advisors. You'll see their names in the credits in just a moment. Tracy, Andrew, Alex, Alon, Paul and Sarah. Not possible without you and the background work you do. David Redmond, CEO of Polaris, the publisher of the Australian Jewish News. What can I say without you? This entire series this year would not be possible. To the team at the Australian Jewish News who behind the scenes put this show together every month, thank you. And to you who join me and our panellists each month to explore the possibilities of future Jews, thank you most of all. Your feedback and generosity that we've received since starting this series has been tremendous and heartwarming. And now it's over to you to take the future of Jewish education debate on the road and make it your own. Talk wildly, debate loudly, dream audaciously about what might be possible. Share this and previous episodes with others exploring the possibilities of future Jews. Until we meet again next month, my name is Morris Mizzle. Take care, be safe, be healthy. Continue to dream bravely and audaciously about what might be possible for yourself, your family, our society, and for future Jews. Until next month.